All right. The grace minute is over. So a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Tobias Schimmer. I'm the CEO at FileWave, and I'm super excited to host you to another Alliance event in this first quarter of 2023. And um, I think today, as always, we have worked hard to bring an exciting agenda to you to show you what's going on with, at FileWave and, and especially, you know, I think that the thing that matters most to you um, really focus on the product and the development uh, around the product. Um, yeah, so as you can see here, Tony Keller, um, our VP of Product Management and Reliability, will take a look into the release that's basically coming out as we speak, 14.10 and we'll talk a bit about what's in there and then also give an exciting outlook of what's coming thereafter. And then Josh Levitsky will talk a bit about the FileWave communities that we're trying to build with you and where we're seeing great traction. Um, in my view, a, a very you know, exciting development to, to really have an even faster and, and more frequent exchange with you, uh, our user base. And then we'll, we'll end with the, I think, both popular and, and now pretty established format, Ask File If Anything, where you can ask any kind of question and we will try to answer it to the best of our ability. Some of you guys have submitted some questions already in advance, so we will try to get as many to as many questions as we can. So with that, I think you, you noticed that we do have a bit of a new design. So our new VP of marketing, Oliver Engelbrecht, who's based in Berlin, Germany, has helped us to, to streamline the way FileWave looks a little bit. And you can see the, the new design here. Um, and with that, we've also, I think, honed in a little bit on the wording that we wanna to use to describe what we're really trying to do. And uh, the tagline that, you know, that we're using to describe what FileWave is all about is endpoint operations done efficiently, which you know we basically want to transport with um, that once you do decide to use FileWave, and I think all of you you know have decided to do so, that part of your job description, I think many of you have have many many more jobs than than just managing endpoints, is basically sorted out. And once you have set it up, you can also do it in a very efficient. Um, way, right? Where you, the time that you have to spend and invest to, to really uh, have set up your, your endpoint operations um, is really optimized and, and spent well. Next slide, please. So, you know, what, what is FileWave all about? What is the vision? What is the company that, you know, the, the hundred and roughly 130 people that we have around the world are trying to build together with you, our customer base? Um, we really strive to become a thought and technology leader in endpoint operations, enabling your organizations out there um, to basically always support your most demanding business needs um, by establishing, managing, customizing, and also evolving your endpoint operations. And all that in a single tool, in a single professional grade solution. And and I think now that, that's, that's a very important end at the end there, paired with expert advice. Um, I have two of the gentlemen, you know, and, and more than that, I think, I think there's actually more, many more on this call that, that represent the deep, deep knowledge that we at FileWave um, have in real endpoint operations. So I think Tony Keller and Josh Levitsky, who will talk after me, are some great role models but not the only ones. We have many, many more, uh, as said, many, many on this call as well, listening in, um, of people that understand you know, your jobs out there in managing your endpoints very deeply, care about it deeply. And uh, we do wanna make these people very accessible to you to, to really involve your environments and you know, set them up in the best possible way um, to, to support your needs. The picture that we have chosen, and again, I, I would love your feedback on it, uh, both good and bad, right? We're, we're an organization where we want to know what you really think uh, we, is the Swiss Army knife because we think it, it really, you know, us being a Swiss headquarters company, 
with our Swiss heritage. Um, it links nicely with the fact that we think we actually a super flexible tool that you know has many different angles um, and, and assets and can really be customized um, really, really to your needs. And, and that's why we thought uh, this multi-tool is actually a, a great picture to represent what FileWave is all about. Um, so I think, next slide. I think with that, this was the intro. Um, again, we ha now have a, a very nice deep look into what's going on around product development, both with the latest release and then also a bit of a glimpse what's coming afterwards, which I personally think is is very exciting step that we're you know, really moving much faster uh, now again on producing innovation in the product. Um, and then after that, we'll also spend a bit about talking about the communities that we offer to engage on an even deeper level with you out there, uh, you know, our, our users of the product. So with that, over to you, Tony. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you could uh, join us today. We've got a really nice crowd here this morning. So it's great to have you all here uh, as uh, Josh kind of steps through the slides here. I'm going to talk about three three different things. Well, I'm going to talk about a number of things on each slide, but, but three basic slides of what we're doing today, what we're doing tomorrow, what we're doing after that, or at least what we're thinking about doing after that, because as Tobias said, we really, really do want your your uh, input on that. But I'm going to talk a little bit today about FileWave 1410. And first, I'll just talk about the version number. You may say, well, 1410 seems a little unusual. Any of you that manage Apple know that it's not that unusual. But uh, we, we thought and thought about this, about whether we, we go to version 15 at this point. But we decided to stick with 1410 because of deployments. And in any of you that joined us last summer for our webinars, you have at least seen deployments a little bit. Uh, we're waiting until the release after this one to go to version 15, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So this next release is version 14.10. Uh, it's in the hands of our early adopters right now, but we'll uh, generally release uh, next week, uh, March the 1st. Uh, it's several things in the release that we're really happy about because Tobias said we're trying to get back to innovations in the product, again, doing things that help on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first thing that we've touched on here is the ability to do a forced reboot in a file set. When we kind of look at the requests that folks, you know, talk about things that are in FileWave today, not, not new features, but things that are in, the, in FileWave today, there's kind of two uh, that are at the top of the list where we've got the most requests. One is reboot behavior. Uh, in file sets, and the other has to do with kiosk. So we try to touch uh, the reboot uh, options within a file set here. And Josh, if you can show that image, uh, this is a, 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 a snapshot from within version 1410. And you'll see there's a new option in a file set when we set a reboot, right? When there's a required reboot and a payload, you can now also force the reboot in the payload settings. So what this will do is we'll forcibly reboot the device two minutes either after either activation of the file set if there's no reboot deadline or two minutes after the, the reboot deadline if it's specified when this file set is deployed. And the use case for this, and, and I do urge caution with this, but the use case for this particular need is around zero day exploits especially. So this is something where you would uh, likely see uh, an issue where you've got a patch for something, a third party patch or an OS patch that you need to get out right away. It's super important to get it out. Um, you can send it with a force reboot and this makes it so that customers can't just ignore the reboot dialogue and move it off to the side of the screen. And you'd think, oh, nobody does that, but unfortunately they do. Uh, take that, that dialogue, just move it off to the side and don't actually reboot. So the patch is never actually effectively applied. This allows you to work around that. But of course you do wanna take this uh, with a, a grain of salt, knowing what impact this could have on the environment. So sending a reboot to a device, so here I'm sitting with my, my CEOs on this call and if we were managing his device in FileWave and he's working on a really long email to the board and he hasn't saved it and he's got that Word document open and we send this thing down to his device and it forcibly reboots, he's going to lose that work, right? So it's not something that we're going to do lightly uh, and it's definitely something we would do with, in coordination with customer communication. Hey, this patch is coming out tonight, just so you know, and it's going to forcibly reboot your device. So you really should, you know, close all your things ahead of time, that kind of thing. 
thing. Uh, but this was it had been a, a highly requested feature, and we're very happy to provide it. Uh, and although I'm giving a screenshot here that's that's from our FileWave Central uh, product, the native admin, it's also in the web admin FileWave anywhere as well. All right, Josh, if you want to go to the next thing there. Okay. Uh, the second thing we've added um, is I really like it because I, I, I feel it's innovative is to to add a customized uh, overlay, a text overlay to iOS wallpapers. Now, of course, uh, Apple MDM supports um, Apple MDM supports setting a wallpaper, uh, but what we've added, in fact, Josh, you can go ahead and, and show that the next image. Uh, this is what the configuration for a wallpaper would look like in 14.9 or earlier. This happens to be from the FileWave Anywhere admin, where you could just, you know, set, hey, this is the lock and the home screen, and we're going to set, the, here's the wallpaper that I want to set, and that's all you could do. Now, within the MDM framework, there's no capability to, say, add text there. Uh, but uh, what we were able to do, and, and this is the effect of that uh, policy you see before, is a wallpaper is applied to the device, and you can set some text down at the bottom, but as you can see, it's super, super, super tiny, right? And so everybody complained, oh, that's too small, uh, but that's what the, the MDM framework allows us to do, is to set that kind of lock screen message down there at the bottom, and that's the best we could do. In this case, it was showing what school, that it's stu student device, the username, and an asset tag. But if you go to the next uh, image there, and Josh, uh, you'll see that now what we've added on top of that is the ability to do uh, both static and customized text on top of this image. This doesn't have, actually have anything to do with the MDM framework, but what we're doing is we're taking this text and we're processing this for every single device where the um, wallpaper is assigned. We programmatically process it. We create an image with the, in this case, dynamic content, which I'll talk about in a second. We take that image that we've created, it, overlay it over the wallpaper that we've set. We can set a position, we can set the text size, and we can set the color of that. And the result is you can end up with, with this particular view, which is now in the lock screen in this case, or in the, uh, on the home screen, you're gonna see the asset tag in, in my, in, uh, environment. And you see here that it's dynamically replaced that value. So I've put a label there that is asset tag. You know, you don't necessarily need to do that. I just did that for clarity here. Uh, but that FW-198724 is my totally fictitious made up um, custom field for asset tag that's assigned to this device. So every singular device is going to have a different um, wallpaper than for it. But what this allows you to do is just very quickly and easily identify an iPad. Because I've, I've seen how you all live that manage thousands of iPads. And every one of you uh, that I've ever seen has a room somewhere with a thousand of the darn things stacked up in piles. Uh, and this just makes it much, much easier to see them. So we're super excited about that particular edition. All right. Any questions or anything so far? I see there's a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Can you have deferrals with the reboot deadline? Can you have deferrals with the, no, not yet, well, not yet. That's one of the additional requests uh, related to reboot. So we've got this whole kind of uh, epic, if you will, of, of different stories for reboot behavioral changes. That's one of them that you could, you know, delay it, uh, you know, for up to X amount of time and, and, and have some more granular controls now. But we um, felt that security use case was the most pressing. So that's the one that we focused on first. And then uh, someone who didn't touch deployments yet, when, when would you suggest they start switching to them? You'd probably let's, think let's, the next release, right? Or, yeah, let's or table start. that one. For, let's table that one for a minute, and we'll talk about it when we get to the to the next slide. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, also, in this, I have to be, you know, at least somewhat contrite here in in, in today's presentation, uh, because many of you had reported to us over the last six months or so that you were seeing issues with Windows clients. Uh, one of the things that we found, and and it's now fixed in fourteen ten. Uh, is that we had a memory leak in our Windows client that we just had super trouble nailing down. Uh, but once we eventually isolated it being related to running a verify on a Windows client that it would take memory and not give it back, uh, what we had was customers that were having trouble with their Windows clients crashing. So we made two really significant fixes around this. One is that we've fixed the leak 
to almost quote office space. Uh, we fixed the leak here so that that leak no longer happens, but also we've made a change to the way that Windows client behaves, that the Windows FileWave client service will uh, automatically restart now if it does indeed crash. Um, you could easily make the argument that we should have already had that, but uh, that's water under the bridge, but we've made that change now. So should we experience an issue in the future like this? Uh, not only would, um, is it possible that something could crash, but if it does crash, the service should restart. And a little later, I think Josh might talk a little bit about how you can do some creative work in FileWave to address an issue like this uh, and try to um, work around problems that are, because the, the issue that we experience with our service in this case uh, could be any service that you have on a Windows device uh, that maybe is critical to your environment. Say it's a, uh, it's a, um, uh, what's the, well, antivirus is one, of course, malware protection, et cetera, those types of services. I was actually trying to think of what's the, the term for the network shield. What, why can't EDR? I? EDR? It was well, that, Yeah, that's one, that's one as, as well. All right, so any mission critical service on the Windows side though, there's some really creative things that you can do with custom fields and scripting to be able to help you uh, deal with restarts and stuff, et cetera. So we'll talk about that, I think a little bit later. Uh, a couple of other noteworthy product additions, and this one is the, the main reason that we're holding off on version 15 now, is deployment. So we've had questions and, and uh, we've been a little all over the place with, with our direction, but we're, we're firmly set on our direction of what we're doing with our product and, and we're staying with the native FileWave Central tool. Uh, but we're also adopting things that we see as ha having been done better in the web and we're using both tools and one of those tools is deployments and there was a question here before about moving over to deployments so in this stage in version 1410 you'll see the deployments now show in central uh, josh if you can go to that next image there you'll see just a little screen grab of my environment where you can see i would except it will not advance Okay, well, imagine in your mind's eye that there's a picture of the FileWave admin here that shows deployments in, in the native admin. Uh, so it's there and you can see them today. You can kind of do two things with it. You can see them uh, and you can delete them. You cannot yet edit them. That will be in our next version. Uh, as well, we've gone ahead and added uh, help menus into the Central and Anywhere uh, products, so both in our native admin console and in our web admin console, to allow you to more easily get directly to the knowledge base, to Foundry, to Discord, which we'll talk about later, and the Alliance forums. So all of those things are in there too. So we're pretty excited about this release. Um, uh, we so also have- So Google, yeah. let, me mm -hmm. just, let me just stop sharing for a second because uh, Google Presentations has let me down. Actually, no, Ring Central let me down. Because uh, I can't stop sharing either. Okay. Well, um, in the meantime, I'll talk about, I did have on the list here, but realized I didn't mention that there are uh, a lot of other bugs and defects addressed. Uh, we've made a couple of significant fixes related to some of the underlying tools that are in the product. We have overall a little bit over 80 uh, different issues that are resolved. Some of them are significant, some a lot less so uh, that are in this version as well. So we highly recommend uh, moving over to this version. We'll talk about some security stuff in a minute. But a couple of other notes here. There is a new port related to NATs that you'll want to enable uh, for notifications in your environment. So that's port 20,124. Uh, eventually we'll run out of port numbers, but we, we certainly have a lot of them. Uh, so that you'll want to make sure that you open up before you do the upgrade so you don't have any kind of notification issues. And the other thing I want to talk about is just best practice stuff because we've had a number of issues over the past few weeks where customers have run into trouble when they're running our solution on on premise, you know, in their own environments uh, and have run into a hardware issue without appropriate backups. It is terrible when that happens because it's it's very difficult to recover from it. Uh, there are certificates, uh, the push notification, uh, the magic token or whatever they call that is you can't really replicate it. Uh, a lot of times you end up in a place where you have to do uh, device re-enrollment. Uh, it's a very ugly scenario. So you really want to make sure that if you're running uh, on premise that you've got good backups of your environment. And that includes um, 
you know, backing up off of that disk because a lot of times what we see is that, oh, okay, we had good backups, but it's actually on the same hardware. And then we lose the disk and then we're, we're in deep trouble um, because they're kind of two pieces. It's the enrollment part that's very difficult uh, to, to fix. And then also all the file sets that you've built over the years, losing that content, that's all stored on disk as well. So uh, very difficult, highly recommend that you, you do backups. But for those of you who are running on-prem, and this is the, the second reason I wanted to mention this, if you uh, don't see any value, and, and largely what we're seeing in Fileway's future is that we don't see a lot of value in you having to maintain the server and go through the process of upgrading all the components and everything every time we release a new version. So we're really looking more at a SaaS offering in future for our product. So what, if you're at all interested, we do have a cloud offering now where we can run your environment for you. And then you don't have to worry about any of the upgrades or backups or recovery or any of that kind of stuff that we're, that we're running that. So if that's something that interests you, please do reach out to either the customer experience team on your renewals or reach out to your sales rep to talk to them about that if you like. Okay, I think we've lost Josh, but that doesn't mean I can't share. So let me... See if I can share my screen. One moment, please. Um, maybe Tony, while you are uh, preparing your screen sharing, just answering some questions I'm typing, but it's probably simpler if I'm talking. Uh, so yeah, there was one question about when to use uh, deployment, starting to use deployment, and when exclusions will be available in Fileway Central Admin. Um, so as Tony mentioned, we are working currently on bringing uh, deployments in native admins, so Fileway Central. Uh, 14.10, you will be able to see the deployments you've created in Fileway Anywhere Web Admin. Uh, and just delete them. And we are currently working to bring complete support for deployment, including exclusion in version uh, 15. Uh, one thing to mention is that uh, we also took the opportunity to, re to work for the management of exclusions under the hood. Uh, we realized that it was in some cases, it was not um, as um, um, predictable as we wanted. So we worked on fixing this and uh, that's something you will not see, but we already made some changes in 1410. So when you will go with 15, it will work smoothly uh, and not break everything if you upgrade first to 1410 to 15. Uh, so that's one answer. There was another question about uh, adding uh, macOS profiles for login, it login and background items in Ventura. That's coming in 1410. So it's there as well. And uh, yeah, I think that's it in terms of questions. I hope I have all of them. Thank you for that, PN. And that kind of leads us into the next thing that we have on this list, which is what's next, like what's on the horizon and what's going on right now is we're in the, the first of three cycles of development for version 15. Uh, and why are we calling this version 15? Well, it's this first item that's in the list. It's what PN was just talking about. It's completing uh, the impl implementation of deployments within FileWave Central and doing some of that housekeeping stuff that PN was mentioning. We see deployments as being the kind of next generation of associations. Not, you shouldn't really think of it probably as replacing associations. They're more like associations plus, uh, where very, very similar to associations, but just taking kind of one step further. Uh, in version 15, that will be fully compatible, finally, I will add the finally in there, uh, between our web solution, the FileWave Anywhere solution, and the FileWave Central solution. So you'll be able to fully use uh, deployments in version 15 uh, in both the native and the web tools. And just to reiterate on the web side of things in the FileWave Anywhere product, we're not looking to make that web interface do absolutely everything that the native solution does. We're looking to make it do 99% of what the normal field technician would do in the field. So things like assigning devices to groups, assigning a Windows image, which happens to be also something that we're doing in version 15, uh, that you can assign an image to a device, that you could uh, choose to restart a device, that you could associate a file set through a deployment, uh, that you could move devices between groups, you could create new groups, and all those things that you would like to be able to do when you're in the field, maybe only even carrying an iPad with you. Uh, it's kind of the target for that solution. 
and then we'll see where it goes from there. We're going to let that grow organically based on the types of things that you tell us that it should be doing. Uh, but we'll finally, in version 15 here, have uh, a totally compatible um, pair of admin consoles between our native solution that we call FileWave Central and our web solution, which we call FileWave Anywhere. We're continuing also to invest in what we call, you know, kind of back-end refactoring of the product to make it more stable and performing, and specifically in version 15 and likely version 15.1 as well. We're working on trying to optimize model update. Uh, we believe there's some time savings to be had there uh, if we can make model update faster, especially in the larger environments where uh, we know it's super impactful for model updates to run. If we can get it faster, uh, there's a, a target number that we have in mind, but I'd rather see that we deliver it before I share that number. Uh, but we are looking to, to stabilize model update and make it more performant. So we're, we're super hopeful that we'll be able to do that in versions 15 and 15.1. Uh, and we're continuing to try to add small features while we're working on planning the longer term, bigger features. Uh, but impactful enhancements that improve your administrator's day-to-day -day management, whether that's you, whether that's other uh, folks as well. The things that we're specifically targeting here for 15 are the ability to duplicate a profile. You cannot do that today. When we build a profile, in the use case here, at least in my mind specifically, is around restriction profiles, where maybe you've built a restriction that's actually quite complex with the number of things that are in it, you need to make another one that's very similar to it, but just with some small changes. Uh, and the way it is today is you have to rebuild that profile from scratch. This will allow you to duplicate a profile and it will automatically handle things like uh, renaming it behind the scenes and everything to handle uh, that part of it. So we're very excited about that one. We're also making a very, it's kind of a small change into the license reporting, but adding some additional fields there. So when you look at uh, licensing, especially with VPP licensing, you'll not only be able to see the things of the serial number, but actually the device name as well when you're looking at those licensing reports. And then the last thing that I'm super excited about is we've always given guidance for a long time and said, hey, if you, if you just need to report on something in FileWave, use a report, use an inventory query rather than a smart group. And the reason we say that is inventory queries only run when you look at them. They're not really running on a periodic basis like smart groups do. Uh, and so smart groups kind of bog down the system a little bit. They're very useful, but we don't want to create additional server load by having them. So we always say, hey, if it's just reporting, if you're not really looking to, to assign content to the device, then do it in an inventory query. But one of the things that's always been difficult in the file central tool is you look at it in the report and what can you do with the device in the report? The only thing you could do is right click on it and there's an option to say reveal client, but then takes you over uh, to the, um, uh, to the client's view with that device highlighted. So what we're doing uh, is we're adding those actions, those right-click actions that you would have in the client view. We're going to add them directly into inventory queries. You'll be able to directly right-click on the device and put it into, say, loss mode, or directly right-click on a device and choose to restart it. So we're, each of those things we're, we're quite happy about uh, doing. The, the work is underway right now. I will show you, I think, uh, I don't have a screenshot for it actually had it. Uh, let me see if I can go back to it just for a second and show you those two. This is the uh, deployments as they are in version 14.10, right? So you can see that they're here. And as I said, you can't edit them yet, but you can uh, delete them. And in fact, I used that uh, when I was doing some of the wallpaper testing stuff. Uh, so deployments now show right there alongside associations. Uh, and we're uh, super excited about that. So in 15, we'll see that. And then, as I said, we also are showing the, there's some new links in the help menu so that you can get to some of our, uh, I don't know why we never thought of this before. And it seems such a small and ridiculous thing that we should have done in a million years ago. Uh, but Josh thought of it. And so we've added all these links directly into the, uh, into the product as well. And again, those are both. And they're, in, they're in anywhere also in the help. Correct, correct. Yeah. They're in both, they're in both. I just showed the, the screenshot from, yep, from yep. Central. All right. All right. What are we doing after that? Well, this is where we'd really, really like your help. Uh, so these are the big things we're thinking about. Actually, we're more than thinking about them. Some of them we're acting on. Uh, and the first one we're definitely acting on, uh, we're working on a facelift for FileWave Central. Uh, we're really excited about this. I'm going to show you kind of a hot off the presses proof of concept here, uh, where our design team uh, sees a vision that kind of looks like this, uh, where we're getting away from that kind of 
1990s look of the product uh, and updating it to be more something along the lines of this. Uh, and then here's kind of a sample of the uh, client info view where you would have your tool sets and things. So, so just a UI refresh of the product. It's been just mentioned about a billion times on all of our NPS surveys that people would really like to see an update to this. So this is just work in progress. There's no code has been done on this. This is just our designers having their way with their ideas. Uh, but you can see we're kind of getting a little bit of a meld of the look of the um, FileWave Anywhere solution, the web solution, and the, the native solution, the central solution, because we don't want it to feel like you're using two entirely different tools, because in reality, you're not. Uh, so we're working on that for sure. Uh, but the other things that we're considering, and, and again, more than considering really, uh, is third party patching. Uh, we can do third party patching today. You can use FileWave, of course, many of you have for many years to build your own third party patches and distribute them. Uh, but we've also got integrated solutions like Winget from Microsoft and Auto PKG, of course, that we can integrate with. And then we're also looking at, at doing something better for those, maybe putting a front end on those, making it super, super simple uh, to use them and a little bit more user friendly than they are today. That's very much on our mind, uh, as well as enhancements to software updates, particularly around the way that we create them uh, and assign them to make it easier to uh, do the mass types of operations that you would like to do. Like, hey, I wanna take all of the patches that have come from Microsoft in this current month and I want to assign them to this, this patch testing group to make that more seamless and easier. Uh, and in fact, any of the topics that you see on this list, if you feel passionate about anything you see here uh, and you'd like to share you know, your feelings on what's missing and, and all that, please just reach out to me. You can uh, via email or, or through customer experience teams, et cetera, whatever's, whatever's easy for you. Uh, and we'd be happy to sit down with you and talk about it, but we're looking at third party patching. Uh, we're looking at uh, enhancements to software update, and this would be work that we'd probably start in the summer. Uh, we're also looking at a kiosk refresh. Now that we've, our team that's been working on anywhere is going to have a little bit of a breather is that kind of uh, gets its legs under it in the in the public forum. Uh, we'll probably utilize that team to refresh our kiosk, uh, both from a behavioral standpoint and a look and feel of the kiosk and make it look, uh, well, it desperately needs a coat of paint and an update. Uh, and we've had a lot of feedback on that as well. So we're really excited to do that. And then the, kind of the last thing and in, in probably a little longer term is to look at more of that reboot behavior like the deferral stuff that was mentioned before. And we're still uh, thinking very strongly about maybe doing something with Chromebooks. So any of these topics that you think, hey, that's something that I really, really care about, please do reach out and, uh, and let us know. Uh, myself, PN, Christopher would love to sit down with you and talk about those things uh, and see that at least the things we're thinking about hopefully line up with the things you're thinking about. And I think that's pretty much it for me. I don't know, I'm not watching the chat, so I don't know if there have been any questions there that we should touch on at this point, or if Josh, you wanna pick up from here. I can pick up from here. There's some stuff in chat, but okay, uh, there's been Stop responses. Here. And we can always double back when we hit the AMA uh, portion and I will share again, and I'm guessing my computer will not completely crash uh, a second time. So, okay. So uh, this slide should be showing, is it? It is. Yes. All right, good, good. So we're back in business. So 1410, uh, like we said, we're, we're going to make it available to everyone. Uh, next week on Wednesday, the download page will be publicly accessible. On Thursday morning, if you're a hosted customer, you'll find that your server was upgraded unless you push back on the date. Um, you're going to see that hosting operations will send out emails to hosted customers, uh, likely today. They're, they're working out just making sure that they have the current list of customers in the email that goes out. And so you should see that note uh, coming out. There should also be a marketing email that comes out in the next week, uh, likely on Wednesday next week. Uh, because we don't have the download page live. So we usually send that announcement when we make that live. Um, some people wanted this update right away because there was a vulnerability in Apache since the first of the year. Uh, we checked and we're not, we're not affected by it, but you know, sometimes when you have security teams, they, they simply want you to upgrade for the sake of upgrading just to be extra, extra sure. Um, there was also an open SSL vulnerability 
uh, that, that we did need the update for, uh, and both of those are in 14.10. So um, you'll want that update. A couple of people reached out to me and asked for it early. Um, and you know, so if you did want to be in sort of that early adopters where you get it first and you get it before uh, next week on Wednesday, uh, you could reach out to me. Um, or if you open a support case, if you don't know how to reach me, uh, if you open a support case, they'll, they'll pass it off to me and uh, we can get you that early if you need it. Um, so beyond these security updates, and they're important because every version uh, generally includes updates to the third party tools that we leverage, like Apache and OpenSSL. Um, when we say, you know, it's really good to go to the latest version, it, it's good beyond just file wave features. It's, uh, it's important for security, uh, right, to, to update when it comes out uh, if you can, um, because you will, you know, avoid your server getting uh, possibly exploited. So just an important thing to call out. Okay, and in theory, I went to the right. Yep, okay. So I was gonna talk about FileWave communities. Um, the past couple of Alliance meetings, we've talked about it uh, because in September, 2022, we launched uh, the Alliance forums and there's an image off to the right there of the forums, right? Um, and Discord, I launched right before we were closed for Christmas um, and People might wonder, well, why do we have these kind of these two different platforms? Why not just one? Um, and it really comes down to Discord is really good if you want to be super engaged, uh, be able to get someone right away. Um, it's chat tends to be more real time. We can hold events there, um, but it's not for everyone. Not everyone wants wants to be in Discord in the chat environment. You know, some people would prefer a web forum. It's just really personal preference. Um, so we kind of made these two paths so that you could go with the one that works best for you. As well, if you're in education, you may not be able to get to Discord when you're uh, you know, at work. Uh, it may be some effort for you to get it approved that Discord could be open to you because generally any chat system you know, in, in education is typically blocked because there's you know probably awful things somewhere in discord too just like the same reason you block facebook and all the other things uh so i will say if you are in an environment that blocks discord and if there's any way that you have an exception as a staff person to be able to get to it there's a lot of good stuff in discord but if you can't the alliance forums we try and bring conversations to both places. If something's posted in the forums, seems really interesting, I'll paste it into Discord and vice versa. Uh, so we try and keep people updated in both places. And uh, we have folks like me and Sean and Andrew and Emma, uh, you know, trying to watch over them, trying to answer things where maybe another customer didn't provide an answer. Um, these, these forums are really for you guys to be able to share with each other, but it's also, you know, we look for things that have been asked that maybe only a file wave person could answer. So that's kind of the, the reason for both uh, existing. Uh, and we will continue to do both. It's not like we're phasing one out. So uh, there's three, uh, there's the barcodes, the QR codes there for both. So if you didn't see the marketing emails with the links, you could, you know, take a picture of that, take a screenshot of this. So you have the, uh, QR code there so that you could get into either. And um, I think at this time, um, John, you could you could put up a poll. There was a little poll we were going to see about if people uh, had checked out uh, the forums or Discord yet, just to get a feeling of where things are at. And so we'll we'll leave that up for a, a moment to collect. And what I'll do also at the start of the AMA when I'm sharing my screen and not the presentation, I'm gonna show you where you can find things in Discord if you do go to, go to Discord. Some people find Discord confusing because it is a bit busy, it does a lot of things, uh, but I'll, I'll show a little bit of how you could find things in Discord. Um, and if you've tried to use the forums and you were confused about how to log in, you, you went to log in to post something and you just couldn't figure out what login that is, it's the same login you would use for support tickets. Um, and if you're not someone who can make support tickets, 
because um, you're not listed as a support contact, you still can use the forums. Uh, you just have to let us know um, that you can't get in there and we'll set you to what's called a limited support contact. That has no cost to it. Uh, and it would get you into the forums. It would get you into the foundry, which is our video based training. Uh, so you want, you want to have that. And sometimes we target emails at the limited support contacts. Well, the limited, the full, the primary, the secondary. We'll send technical emails at people that are in those roles because we figure if you're in that role, you're probably interested in that technical topic. So, okay. So probably that was enough time for people to vote. So I will just continue on to the next slide. And <clears throat> to that end, you know, focusing specifically on Discord, um, we are holding events within Discord. Now, for those that can't get to Discord, we're recording them. Uh, and so the, the QR code on the left there will get you to our YouTube channel, for instance. Uh, so what we're doing is we're having the event in Discord. We're recording it because it might not be at the best time. You know, 12 noon for me is midnight in Singapore. You know, so if you're based in Singapore, you really wouldn't want to be on at midnight with me. Uh, so you could check out the recording in YouTube. And we're going to try and put things at various times to make it so that people could join live if they want. Uh, but if you can't get into Discord or you don't want to go into Discord, the videos are getting posted on YouTube. And so you could just watch the video on YouTube and, and benefit from it in, in that way. So that's kind of our, our tactic. And some of the things that we're having uh, sessions on, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have one on Grafana, just kind of getting started, the basics of Grafana. Um, we're going to have some, every month we actually have professional services open office hours. So you can come there and ask questions. Totally like free session. Uh, we're going to set up more of them so that we kind of have three sessions a month uh, that are in the various time zones. So like Sean, who's in the UK, you know, he can hold a session that's good for Europe. Uh, Jeff over in Asia, he can hold something that's, you know, great for, you know, Singapore or Vietnam or uh, anywhere around there. Uh, and I would, you know, I or Emma or Andrew can hold things that are good for the U.S. Uh, so maybe we can make a variety of times and, you know, kind of include everybody in every time zone. Um, we're going to have a session on third party patching, uh, you know, kind of some kind of goes back to how Tony was mentioning patching and that we can do third party patching. We think some people might struggle with the right ways to approach it or, or knowing what ways to approach it. So um, those sessions might be good for beginners or even if you're really good at third party patching, uh, you know, you maybe you could join and have some advice to add. That's one of the nice things about the discord chats is everybody can participate and share. Um, they're, they're yeah. small enough. Yeah. There's a, a question from the, the chat about limited support contacts and can they get access to some of these resources? So limited support contacts get access. Well, Discord, you can just sign up for. Actually, you don't need to be any kind of contact. Uh, but the Alliance forums, the Foundry, um, anything else that we share, generally the login is open to limited support contacts who have, it, it's not a paid role, it's a free role just contact uh, customer experience. Uh, so it's customer.experience at filewave.com. And, you know, if you can't log in, they can, they can set you straight and uh, get you access. Uh, YouTube obviously is open to anyone. So to, to reiterate what you're saying there is limited support folks should already have access. But if you yes. don't have, if you don't have folks that are set up as limited support, they would need to have a contact created for them, correct? Yeah, yeah, and customer experience could do that. So, and actually it's kind of important, and I see the email address was just shared by Emma, thanks. Uh, if you've had turnover in your organization, and maybe the admin has changed there, maybe so, the people that use FileWave have changed, you should probably reach out to customer experience and just make sure that they have those uh, contacts because that will control access to some of the things like the foundry. Um, and when we send out emails about events and things, then, then we're contacting the people that are there. I've seen in some cases where an admin leaves and the new admin actually 
was still using the old admin's email because emails were still going there. And then I would help set that straight and, and put the actual email in for the new person. So uh, good to keep those updated you know, so we could be in contact with you and, and share the things you need. So, okay. So, and we're gonna kind of talk more about Discord when the AMA starts, but um, Fawive Assist, I've also talked about this on the last few sessions. Um, we have about, about 60 customers actually at this point doing Fawive Assist and um, anyone who wasn't on past sessions and maybe doesn't know what this is, I've been getting a lot of questions because we mention it in renewals. Um, so I just wanted to give another opportunity and we can answer questions in the, in the AMA or maybe a couple of questions right now, but um, this barcode would get you the PDF uh, that would kind of explain the program. And the program is of various sizes. So if you're a very small organization, uh, we typically team you up with two other organizations uh, to have monthly sessions about roadmaps, uh, best practices, health check kind of things, talking about new, you know, a new release comes out. Well, what does it mean for you? What do you need to know? Um, we'll help you keep things on the rails, keep them going well. Um, and in the larger versions of this, there might be some in-depth training beyond, you know, the monthly sessions. We kind of grow it based on organization size. And uh, so, you know, if you're an organization that has 20 people using FileWave as an admin, you probably have some amount of turnover, some need to train, and training is kind of part of this as well. So it's a program that's ongoing every month, kind of do it in sync with your renewals. Uh, so if you think that you're not taking full advantage of FileWave, if you think that, you know, you can really benefit from something that's kind of a monthly ongoing uh, thing, then, you know, check this out. And we've said before that we were initially doing it in North America. Um, this, we can handle anywhere globally. Uh, and so if you see this and you're interested, I suppose the best thing to do would be reach out to customer experience, no matter what region you're in, and just let them know that you're interested in this program and we'll get connected. And if you want to have a call with me, they'll link you up with me and we can chat about it. Um, so it's, a, it's been going really well. Okay, so the foundry. Um, this kind this ties into really everything right so we we have the file wave certified administrator course um that is getting some you know overhaul this year like i said last year it's it's going to get some overhaul get some more things about the web admin or file wave anywhere um and so looked to that to improve we've had people taking the certified administrator course if you don't know what that is um there's an exam uh you get to use materials in the foundry plus homework in the foundry that you wouldn't see unless you're in the program. When you submit the homeworks, they get graded, usually by Sean. He handles uh, pretty much all the grading of the assignments. And so the idea of the homework in the foundry is that you can try out what you learned and then somebody like Sean can look at it and see, you know, was there an issue with how you did it? And then he'll provide guidance. He won't just say you got this right or wrong. You know, he'll, he'll offer a tip or an explanation. Um, and along with that um, file with certified admin program, you get three hours of one-on-one -on -one time. So if there's a topic that doesn't make sense, you could set up a session, uh, you know, and in the different regions, it would be like Jeff could handle it in Asia and Sean in uh, Europe and Andrew and Emma and myself in North America. So we have folks globally uh, that can do things in your time zone. And, you know, through those three hours and the homeworks, the exam at the end to prove, you know, to yourself what you knew and you get a certificate at the end that can prove to maybe your manager or supervisor that, you know, you completed some training, maybe that certificate could help you with, um, some other certification that you have with renewing it. Um, right now, the certificate doesn't mention a number of hours, um, but if that's something that you need for like professional development, um, I can tweak the certificate uh, to include something like that. Um, I already wanna make that change to have it say a certain amount of hours that completing the FCA is equal to. So I guess think about that and if you need that. Um, there's a QR code here for the Foundry if you haven't seen it. Um, if you're, you know, 
if you commute to work or you're traveling ever and you want to use Foundry when you're, I don't know, on the train going to work, um, we support the Moodle app. So on iOS or Android, if you look in the App Store, there's a Moodle app. So Foundry runs on Moodle. A lot of schools use Moodle. Uh, it's M-O-O-D-L-E, Moodle. Um, so you can use that app to actually download uh, portions of the courses so that you can watch a video while you're on the go. Uh, can make it more helpful. Um, and as well in the Foundry, because kind of everything leading to the FCA is all the material in the Foundry. And no matter whether you're doing the FCA or not, um, you might go to the Foundry just to learn how to do something. And we've found that when we get new customers or if you replace an admin and a new person comes in, you know, it's, it's a little difficult to get started, right? And the courses in the Foundry have always been very deeply technical. Um, we are making um, a, a course in the Foundry that'll be kind of like a, a 100 totally overview and very high level uh, set of videos that would be great for the new person that just needs to touch on well what are associations what, what do I do with them um, you know or how do I you know connect with team viewer just at a high level what what does it do for me uh, so those videos we're targeting for uh, April to have those done and those will be free for you to access and they're going to be integrated into uh, what we're doing with onboardings when someone becomes a new customer, uh, you know, we're going to integrate those videos into the onboarding process so that we'll get you a little bit set up, then maybe you'll get to watch the videos. And then you come back to work with us. It gives you the ability to ask more meaningful questions in the onboarding process. I know everybody on this is probably already through their onboarding, but if you feel a little weak in some area, maybe these newer videos will help you. Um, so that's an ongoing process. Okay. So now the part that, you know, folks generally, uh, a lot of people come here just for the AMA part. Uh, and, and we like this part because it, it kind of lets us address things that we may not have thought to address in a KB article. Sometimes these lead us to make a KB article because we realize we didn't explain this in the knowledge base yet. Um, but uh, I should also mention when I go to show Discord that in those open office hours, think of those like AMAs that we hold every month. So we still want to keep up with this. We're going to have this session in the alliance in this alliance e meeting each quarter. But there's kind of an extra AMA that you can do in Discord. So then let's get started on this part. Uh, so. FileWave admin. So these were questions that were submitted before the event. So we figure we'll run through these, make sure they're answered, you know, and then we could kind of open it up to new ones. Um, but FileWave admin on Linux or, or Linux client in the future. Um, so FileWave admin, there's sort of an easy answer, which would be FileWave anywhere you could use, you know, within Linux. Um, but as far as a client, I think a client or a, or a sort of native admin, um, we'd have to see, uh, I guess a good strategy would be go to product board. So that's where you can submit, you know, that you'd like things. You can kind of vote on things and uh, say, you know, we have 10,000 Linux devices and we really need to manage them, you know, or, or even we have 50. Linux devices and we really need to manage them. Kind of explain what you're looking for because that can help folks like Tony look at uh, sort of the, see the demand and see the explanation. Uh, if you want to run FileWave Admin natively on Linux, maybe explain, you know, hey, our company or our organization is largely going to Linux desktops and we need to be able to manage them and run the admin. So that would be what I would probably do. And if you don't know where product board is, there was a QR code earlier, but also in the knowledge base. If you look for product management, uh, there is a link to product board there. Okay. Um, okay. And plans to do away with the admin app. I think Tony touched on that when my computer crashed earlier. Uh, but no, there's no plans to do away with the admin app. Um, 
I think people were worried about that because of the way things were going all uh, web, uh, but now it should be clear that it's both. Uh, yeah, Tony? No, I was gonna go ahead and let you answer this one if you wanted to. Oh, but, number no, three? No, yeah, no, I, I've got it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have to fall on our swords a little bit here when it comes to version 14.9.2 with relation to decreased server performance. Um, to be honest, it's still a little bit of a mystery to us, but I can I can verify that what we have seen in in only the larger environments, those were, you know, over say a thousand uh, desktop devices, Mac, Windows devices, those types of environments, where we've seen the upgrade to 14.92 create some bottlenecks in processing that we still haven't quite nailed down. Uh, in each of those environments where we've looked at performance issues, we've been able to just optimize them and, and do th some things like making sure that the boosters are routing messages from clients and that boosters are accessible from everywhere on the network, those types of things. And it's addressed, it, it has addressed those, but we're not really done with this topic because we don't know the root cause. Uh, this is the number one thing that, that actually myself and Josh have been working on for the past few weeks is to try to nail down exactly where that performance uh, issue is coming from. If you feel that, you're, you, that you've witnessed this in your environment, feel free to open a support ticket on that. And, and we're happy to look at that with you to see if we're seeing any of these things. Uh, there were a couple of things in 1410. I, I, I had mentioned that there were a, a number of bugs that were fixed. Several of them have to do with some of the kind of smaller things that we've found with relation to this. One, a, a little bit bigger issue has to do with if you had Android devices set up, uh, the Android sync or the file wave sync with Google for Android devices was happening too frequently. That was definitely delaying some things, uh, but there aren't a whole lot of uh, environments that are doing that. So this is an ongoing issue for us. We, as I said, we've been able to, to get each environment that we've touched working correctly. The question we have is, well, it was working before and all we did was upgrade and it, and it stopped working as well. Why? That why, that's what we're continuing to work on. So we don't have an answer yet. Uh, but the more environments we're able to look at, I think the more we'll get honed in on that. So I guess number four. Um, so in this case, uh, I think that the answer is the thing that, um, that support does where they kind of tell the device to re-enroll itself. I mean, more or less, we don't, I don't have the KB article posted but I know support has a mechanism to try without, without wiping the device. I think I'm remembering this one, right? Um, so I guess, you know, if you have one like this, probably reach out to support. Uh, but when you see that there's a KB article posted, then there's something that you could try yourself. Um, and yes, this is where and the- I'm guessing that that oh, question is probably at least partially related to number six here. Um, in this one, we, we probably need to talk about a little bit as well. We've had a lot of you tell us that you're struggling with Mac OS updates, uh, and that is true. Uh, there have been a number of issues. If you remember, right, I, I can't remember how long ago it was, maybe 18 months or so ago, Apple made a change away from the software update mechanism and towards MDM uh, for software updates. That has been, uh, well, if I'm being fair, a little rockier than I think everybody would have liked it to be. Well, we you seen in environments right now is that the MDM client, actually the Apple MDM client on devices stops listening sometimes on the channel that does software updates. Uh, what we're trying to do is see what we can do to help this. I believe Apple is aware uh, of some of the issues with software updated and working on some fixes there, which would likely mean an update to devices. So we're trying to uh, we're trying to see what kind of workarounds we can come up with as, if there's a way that we can report on it. But um, we're a little bit restricted there. One thing we were considering was posting a knowledge base article for kind of working around some of the MDM delivery issues uh, by continuing to use the, the deprecated but still existing software update command that's still on Mac devices in the field. Uh, so we're, I think we might see something from us on that in the knowledge base a little later this week, uh, that at least it's not a great solution, but it's at least a workaround if you have something mission critical to get out to devices. Uh, but this is another area where we've seen some su significant issues. Uh, and, it, and of course, it's a partnership between us and, and Apple on that. So we're continuing to work on it. 
And so doubling back to five, group policies or device configuration policies for Windows. So this one's nice because we already have this, uh, Windows MDM. If you, and this was asked in the chat too, uh, about uh, something that was sort of group policy-like for Windows client. Um, so go to the knowledge base and search for Windows MDM. Um, so we have something called CSPs. Um, well, I should say Microsoft has something called CSPs. They're like, they're like the Mac OS profiles, but for Windows. And you can set various things. There's, uh, there's already a handful of CSPs in there, but it does at this time require you to set up Windows MDM. So check out the articles and see if, if there's any challenges there. You need things like Microsoft Azure Premium P1 or P2, for instance. Uh, you don't need Intune. Uh, some of the documentation from Microsoft will be misleading a little bit. It'll make you think Intune, but when you look at how they've written it, they kind of say Intune or another MDM, basically. And we would be that MDM that they're referring to in, in, the, uh, in those things. So that would be, I guess, the equivalent to maybe group policies. And if we get granular with this question for a second, though, kind of the way that I interpret it was, uh, is, does FileWave have anything to do with group policies on the devices? And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. If we take the first half of the question, uh, yeah. Huawei doesn't have anything explicitly to do with group policies, but there's a reason that I, that I really love uh, the product's flexibility. Uh, we don't have anything built in that does anything with group policies. However, you can do things with file sets, with scripts, and with custom fields, and even FileWave policies to enforce or do stuff with group policy evaluation. You can make uh, devices do a GP result right? You can uh, report on them. You can make them refresh as well. So you can do those kinds of things and force it, but there's no uh, built-in interoperability between FileWave and a, and a standard, you know, kind of old school Active Directory to GPL. And I say old school, but the reality is most environments are still doing that, right? Uh, we built out the Windows MDM environments because we had heard from lots of folks that they were really wanted it and they wanted to move to Azure Active Directory fully. Uh, we haven't really seen that as much in practice, but the way it works on that side is that you'll have both a FileWave client and the Microsoft MDM client, uh, very much like the way Apple works. And so the way those uh, configuration policies, those CSPs that Josh mentioned work, is they're assigned to the device like a normal file set. That CSP then is, is listed in the manifest for the device the manifest for the device, the client says, oh, look, I need this thing. And then it asks the uh, Microsoft MDM client that also points at FileWave to go and get it. Uh, so it goes and gets that CSP and it actually does it differently than, than uh, Apple. It does not do it on demand, it's on a scheduled basis. So I think it's about every 30 minutes that it reaches out and looks for whatever new thing it should pick up. But if you have a device that's Windows MDM enrolled, that's in FileWave, any CSPs that you apply like any uh, normal file set will be applied then uh, through that MDM client. And you can see those in FileWave anywhere. If you go to payloads and then you go to configurations, new configuration, there's a Windows one. Even if you don't have Windows MDM set up, you can see what ones are available there. So, okay. So then we have page two. So <clears throat> the, the features on the web portal, uh, FileWave admin client, right? So exclusion. So, so that's about, you know, how you can exclude things in deployments. Uh, most likely that's the way I read that. Yeah, um, and that's one, one of the things that PN was mentioning. We were kind of cleaning up a little bit as we're making those available in FileWave Central as well. So that work is, is, is in progress now. There's actually very few things in the Anywhere solution that aren't in the native tool. But the topic that we just talked about, Windows MDM, is, is kind of the one. It is the one thing that really is in web that, that uh, by itself is not there. And you mentioned reporting, uh, the person that asked the question mentioned reporting in this case, that's really just a nomenclature change in the reporting that's in the web uh, versus the reporting that's in the native console because inventory queries and reports are actually the same. Just a different, yeah. just a different label. And I would say in, in, in central, um, editing queries is more powerful. There's more ability to create things, but viewing them in anywhere, you'll see all those things that you made in Central. 
that's kind of where it is today. And um, in the Foundry, if you check out Foundry, there was a web admin webinar video that everyone should be able to see that we did last summer uh, that is still applicable about the only change would be the fact that deployments is now visible in uh, Central. But you may want to check out that video that's in the Foundry if you've never watched it before, because it kind of goes through everything you can do in anywhere. Um, you know, as of last summer, which is still pretty much this, pretty much the same. So, okay, I would love a build a script option for FileWave for more advanced administration of macOS hardware that isn't native to FileWave. I, so in this example, um, I think that the way that we've, we've always handled it in the past was with what we call recipes in the knowledge base where we kind of give you the steps. But I entirely, I think of this question as a neat thing where we might have a library where you could just pick maybe certain actions and you know, just put it in right from a library in FileWave. And I'm guessing that's what the person was thinking of. Um, so I'd say probably for this one, Tony, we'd say they should submit this idea to product board, right? So that it's just recorded and then vote on it when it shows after somebody submits it. Yeah, and, and requests around this kind of thing where it comes scripting, it, it becomes dangerous, not dangerous, it becomes difficult to, to look at building in something to the product that then by its nature ends up taking away the flexibility. So when I looked at things, especially with the scripting options in FileWave, they're so flexible now that a lot of times what we see is that this type of thing actually gets uh, created and resolved in things like Discord and the, uh, the Mac OS admin Slack channel and, the, and Alliance as well, where what we love to see happen with the community is that people do start sharing this kind of stuff because almost never are you having to do it for the first time, right? A lot, you know, almost always somebody else has done it before. And we're trying to get better ourselves at sharing some of the, you know, tips and tricks and things that we do uh, in-house to, to help customers too. So that both, I think both angles are, are good ones here. And uh, okay. So is there a way to remove file sets for apps? that you are no longer using. Yeah, you know, this kind of goes back to the whole best practice thing about cleaning up. Um, but it's actually more than that, right? So in a Apple School Manager, uh, they moved their licenses to license storage, um, which I haven't looked at recently. Uh, so that's like a form of archiving, right? But they show up in file because of that automatically create file set option. So I wonder on this one if it's you know specific to ASM and that maybe we have to do something with uh, things in license storage not getting file sets created that might be a an enhancement yeah maybe and I, I also think it, not only that but also this is I know this is about uh, an existing request as well for just things that you've built right not even coming from VPP but things that you've built uh, for uh, file sets, payloads, et cetera, that are no longer associated to anything. Seeing those is a little bit of a challenge uh, and, and looking at things by date. So I know there's a couple of requests around that and which are all, all really good requests. Um, mass swiping iPads. Um, so if you're in Central and you select more than one iPad, you'll see that you can't pick to wipe. Uh, if you're in anywhere, you'll see that you can pick to mass swipe. Um, so in anywhere you could technically do this from what I've, what I've seen. Uh, and because there's an API for wiping, you could actually make a, a script if you wanted to that would go through a list of serial numbers and do a mass swipe. If you're gonna do it through a script, be very sure of your list of serial numbers because you know, you're wiping the devices. Um, in the KB, we have an article that has a script um, that bulk changes the enrollment user um, and I believe the device name for iPads. That same script could easily be changed to do device wipes. It actually can take a CSV that has a list of serial numbers, it looks up the device, and then does the action uh, of renaming the device to whatever name you want and setting the enrollment uh, user field to be whatever user you want to say is assigned to the device. 
but you could easily throw into that a thing to wipe out the device. Um, and that would not take much scripting knowledge at all. Uh, but if you ever run into something where you, you would really like to automate it, you can't quite figure it out, reach out to professional services, um, you know, because we can, we can work with you and help you. Or Discord and the Alliance forums, ask the question and someone may have a simple answer for you. So that should help. Um, and then there was, you know, after COVID-19 and the fact that some of our software is moving to the cloud, we have more clients that, you know, are not on the company network, right? And so this question uh, stems from if you are a customer that has an on-premise server where you run it yourself and your on-premise server is only reachable internally, um, then you rely on devices coming onto VPN to talk to the server. But that's not, keeping it inside your network is not a requirement of file you can make your FileWave server be available on the internet. In fact, for any of our hosted customers, those are basically FileWave servers running on the internet in Amazon's cloud or Oracle's cloud. Um, so we can totally do that, you know, and expose them. And you, you have a couple of choices. Um, this is not the best from a security perspective, but you can use port forwarding to tunnel in to your server. Uh, you can move your server to your DMZ. Um, I guess the most important thing is how do your clients talk to your server? If they use a proper DNS name, you know, like if it was, you know, like filewave.com is my server, right? For here at FileWave. Um, if I'm using a real DNS name, then it's super easy because you can move that server out to your DMZ. You can change your firewall rules. Um, if you're not using a a certificate that's signed by a certificate authority, you could switch over to using a real cert. We, we tend to tell people that if you're using a self-signed cert, that's not the best choice. Um, at some point there will be problems with that. Um, we encounter all sorts of things. So a real certificate obviously is better, but you could move a server that's internal to external and your devices would talk to it as long as you change your DNS so that they know how to get there. Uh, it's it's not that hard and um, I would guess that if you did struggle with how to do this you could open a support case to ask kind of the you know the basic questions about it like hey I moved it and I'm not sure why this is you know not working um, if you need you know some more advanced help and maybe want someone to work with you to do the whole process then professional services we can do that uh, as a as a paid project we can kind of help you through that uh, but that is that is totally possible. You can run FileWave on the internet and have your devices always able to reach it. In fact, Tony and I, when we worked together two companies ago, uh, when we managed devices, I mean, back in even like 2002, we had our management system out on the internet. And because we, we saw even back then that there were devices that would leave the network. Uh, even before COVID, there were people that would work from home and they wouldn't come on VPN nearly enough and security patching was really important. And if you need to report on things like if security updates have gone out, you know, if uh, certain things are set a certain way for security compliance, then you really do want your server reachable on the internet and by your clients all the time. So, okay. Uh, that I know was the last question and I'm going to drop out of the slideshow um, and then we're going to go over and see uh, what questions there are. But before that, let me just bring up Discord because I said I would show uh, a little bit with Discord for folks and I'm going to show the Alliance forms too. So you're seeing my view, which looks more or less like your view when you're in here. Um, so if you do join Discord, there are these things called channels. And if you ever used internet relay chat in the past, I mean, that's kind of like what Slack and Discord really are. They're basically IRC, but today. Um, there is a channel called events, and that is where you will see events that we're gonna hold are always posted here. So you will see that there is a description, there is a date and time along with time zone conversions, 
you'll see, you know, who's signed up for a particular event, you know, and we put a little logo to make it easy. Um, this Alliance meeting's in here. Although it's not being held in Discord, I still put it here to be consistent so that folks would be aware of events. Um, any event gets what's called a thread. So that if you click on the six messages, you can kind of have a discussion about this event. Like, if you have a question about it, would this be appropriate for me? Are you gonna cover this particular thing? That's what those threads are good for. Um, the best practices session, we posted this on YouTube. It's in our YouTube channel. Uh, this will be another one. I'm gonna hold these every few months because as the product changes, I think the best practices discussion will change a little bit. So it's worth having this and then recording the subsequent one, posting that in YouTube as well. Uh, this would be those open office hours that I mentioned where there's just one per month right now, but we're looking at covering different time zones. Uh, this one may work for someone who's in Europe or North America uh, with the time that it's at, but it's not really great for Asia Pacific. So we're going we're gonna to add some additional ones per month. Um, boosters best practices. So going to that question about 1492 and the performance of it or lack thereof, um, what we found consistently was that we found cases where boosters weren't either weren't configured ideally or weren't present at all or were removed because you know they didn't seem like they were doing you know what they should and so I thought it'd be important to have a booster best practice to kind of go over that because regardless of whatever performance thing hit in 14.9.2, it is always a good idea to have boosters. Um, and I'll talk about it in this thing. It's gonna happen in a few weeks and then it'll post to YouTube. So no, you'll see it on our YouTube channel if you subscribe to that channel. And, um, and maybe you'll walk away from that video or the session if you join it. Uh, understanding a little bit better what boosters can do, what they can't do. For instance, if you have iPads, a booster doesn't really help you. But if you have Mac and Windows, they do, and we'll go over why. Um, so I suppose even if you just had iPads, you might benefit from us talking about um, like an Apple caching server would come up in relation to this topic. So we have that. Um, the third party app patching, there's two of these. So notice that there's one for Mac OS and then there's one for Windows. We wanted to hold separate ones. There are one, one's on a Monday and one's on a Tuesday. We wanted to split it up because we know there are some of you that only do Mac or only do Windows. We figured it was a cleaner conversation to have the Mac one and then the Windows one and have videos for both. And so, if you watch in this channel, you'll see, you know, that we're posting events and there may be things that you're interested in. Um, so over here in general, you'll see that these topics show up. Uh, it, it'll make more sense as you use Discord, but this tips for using Discord was something that I posted. It was a thread that I posted and pinned that talks about how Discord works. Um, as well, when you join Discord, we send you a message that gives you a YouTube video that's a 12-minute video that gives a very high level how to use Discord. So if you never used it before, it would be worth watching because it will help you to get started. And once you're started, it's really easy. It just, it does, there is a little learning curve to using it. Um, but it is a really good platform. Um, so... Uh, that's the thing. There are these kind of topic channels to keep things organized, right? So if we're talking a lot about boosters, why not keep that in a booster channel? It just makes it easier to find. There's also search. So I can, you know, search for, um, like, actually, I was searching for Let's Encrypt before because I knew that somebody talked about using Let's, Let's Encrypt, but I couldn't remember where it was. So when I did the search, I found it right away. Uh, so the search is great. It builds up sort of a, another knowledge base of, of information. And I try and take things we learn here and in the Alliance forums, and I try and make knowledge base articles when I realize that we've maybe missed, you know, something. So it jumped here, and there was actually a customer who posted how to use Let's Encrypt with FileWave. So I wanted to share that. And, you know, ultimately, I still do OU oh, Guys a KB article 
from us on using Let's Encrypt. I have the script. I just haven't been able to post the KB article. I want to make sure that it's it's polished and, and correct, but that is still on my to-do list to post. So um, as well, 1410, I've kind of been posting statuses about it, like as it's going to keep people informed. So if you're not in early adopters, you just kind of know what's going on. If people are running into issues, uh, if we realize that there's known issues, I'll post it probably in this 1410 thread, you know, just to keep it organized. Um, but check this out if you haven't. Um, and, you know, Discord has other things. There's other reasons why you might want to go to Discord. You'll see all these kind of icons down the side. These are other Discord servers that I'm in. Uh, there are really some helpful uh, Discord servers out there. And I even made a channel because it can be hard to find them. Uh, this other one called Other Discords. You know, anybody who is in IT, and if you watch any YouTube, you've probably heard of Network Chuck. He's very good at explaining almost any topic. So I put his Discord in here. Linus Tech Tips is another one. So if you know of a really good and helpful one, you know, for doing IT stuff, you could share it in here, and then it'll help others. So, okay. So that would be Discord. And while I was talking, were there any questions about Discord before I switch over to the Alliance forums? I, I didn't see in the chat. The only thing I saw in chat was somebody who was kind of uh, mimicking my uh, issues, trying to get signed up for something. <laughs> or maybe maybe you all can do what I do with this when you can't do it. Is just say, "Hey, Josh, can you can you do this for me?" Because <laughs> I'm uh, I'm evidently old. I wasn't aware until this Discord was stood up, but I'm uh, I'm now officially old, and so I have to learn to use it myself. <laughs> Was it about signing up for the events? Yes. Ah, okay. So all you have to do, well, one is you don't really have to be signed up to, to go to it. All you have to do is come into Discord and you'll see that the event will say happening now. And it will, it will say, it will have a link and tell you where it is. But I'll tell you that it is always now in the voice channels. There's one called Center Stage. And what you'll see is you'll see a whole bunch of people will be in there. Uh, center stage can handle uh, 300 people at one time. I would love if we had 300 people at one time in one of these so that I could ask Discord about a way to go bigger. Uh, but for now, this will suit our needs and then we can record it and post it on YouTube. Um, we do also try to tie our social media together. Uh, so for instance, you might not know that we have a Twitter account where we announce things. So you know, if you look at this channel, you'll see things that we're sharing on Twitter. You'll see, for instance, as videos get posted on YouTube, they end up here. So this Alliance event, when it hits YouTube, will get posted here too. We don't want to have you having to look at a hundred different places. So if you're active in Discord, you'll kind of see all the things in one. So, you know, one ring to rule them all kind of thing. Uh, so, although that's multiple rings, isn't it? But uh, yes, so you'll, you can follow our various things here. So, okay. So I wanted to go over to the Alliance forums because there will be some of you that just do not go into Discord, right? For whatever reason, maybe it's not open on your network. So this is the Alliance forum, so alliance.filewave.com. When you come here, it will say login up here. Um, your login is the same, it's that limited support contact or full support contact. It's that single sign-on login. So I think if I do this, right, well, maybe sign out didn't work too good, but let's see if I'm actually signed out. Yeah, so it'll look like this and you won't be able to post anything and you'll wonder why. And you have to go to sign in and I'll do, set, I'll do staff in my case. And now I would be capable of posting. See, so start a new topic appears. Um, in here, again, it's grouped kind of by topic, but you can always throw something in general if you're not sure. Same thing in Discord, there's a general channel where you can kind of put anything if there's just, you don't know what channel to put it in. Um, if you're wondering what got posted here, there's this activity feed that's really helpful. And when you look at activity, you'll see, you know, these are various posts that went on. So you can see kind of like what happened in, in recent time so that you can kind of keep up on things. 
Um, and realize yeah, this is just yeah. I see the first comment in there, and it and it uh, reminded me that there was something I wanted to talk about with the wallpaper thing earlier that I forgot to, which was that dynamic element of that text that you saw <laughs> earlier in that wallpaper that I talked about talked about it that is something that i've seen a lot of folks haven't actually touched with file wave and if you're not doing that you're kind of missing out on a great opportunity uh, within file wave to leverage dynamic content for devices um, which can be things like like asset tag like what we were using before it can also be things that are based on evaluating uh details from uh, a device itself through scripts etc so uh, if you have not looked at using uh, dynamic content in either configuration profiles, which we call parameterized profiles, which I, I kind of like the alliteration, but it's a it's a long name. Uh, so you can use those variables though in configuration profiles, and you can also use them in scripts, and they're super helpful. So you can see a few of the examples here, and and any custom fields that you build, you can use there as well. So for instance, the one that I used, which was percent asset underscore tag percent was one that I created. I created a field called asset tag. We don't have a built-in field for that. Other examples, if I were still running a live environment, I'd probably have a field to read the virus definition versions of whatever antivirus that I'm using on my, uh, on my devices, right? That would be something that I'd really want to see. Um, the way that you can use this in configuration profiles, especially with things like email address, for instance, uh, if you're doing LDAP integration, especially, as you can use that to then populate configuration profiles so that people don't have to type in their first name, their last name, their email address, for instance. Those can all be dynamically put in the profile. And then all the user has to do on onboarding uh, is type in their password. You know, the only thing you don't know, for instance. So I just wanted to mention that because I forgot to do it earlier. Yeah, and I have the wallpaper profile where I had percent serial number percent. And you mentioned how you made a field, right? And if someone wonders how they would do that, you know, that's really the custom fields. And when I go here, you'll see that there's this internal name, right? That can be referenced by variable. So, and actually these custom fields about the configuration of boosters that we're gonna talk about in the, the booster best practices. Uh, this is in a KB article that we recently published. Uh, and these fields can really help you to validate that your clients really are configured to see boosters. Um, and there's a couple of more fields that aren't in here uh, that are in the KB article for the port number because uh, Tony and I ran into a case where uh, the booster was defined by name, but the port number was zero. And the only way to really spot that would be to have a custom field that, you know, kind of called that out. But that, that tripped Tony and I both up for a little bit. We thought everything was fine until the booster port was zero. You might show while we're just in there for a second, Josh, on the, uh, if you do an inventory query, uh, if you edit any one of them, when you, uh, for, for the built-in fields, uh, you'll notice on the left that any fields that you see, if you click on one of the fields, you can pick Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Josh, that yep. down at the bottom, it's going to give you the internal name for that field as well. So you can see it for any of the built-in fields. We give you some of them there in the knowledge base article, some of the most used ones. But if there's something else that you wanted to use, for instance, building the built-in building field, it's not actually used for anything in most environments, but uh, the internal name for that is building. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was a good topic. Um, was there any other chat stuff going on? I there saw was another Andrew. question uh, with relation to, to Discord about whether there's any kind of uh, expiration policy on content or anything. So I believe not. They, they specifically don't purge. Um, I know, I know with GDPR that there have been concerns that will be worked out, of course, because Discord will, will face either implementing such things like the right to be forgotten. Uh, right now you could delete your Discord name and it, it deletes that you, I, there's then no relation to you, but the messages are left behind. So we have to see how that plays out between uh, Discord and the EU. Um, 
but my guess is that they'll implement the policies to to handle things like right to be forgotten. Uh, and and when they do that, we'll we'll have to think about how to implement them to be compliant, or maybe they'll just be set by Discord, uh, because you might imagine that there's a lot of benefit to conversations not getting purged, because then that 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 pool of knowledge goes away. Uh, but there are certain rules in places like EU where um, you should be able to ask to remove your data or to be able to download all the data related to you. And I, I believe that Discord um, is not there yet where they need to be. So, and that could be one thing that pushes you personally over to the Alliance forums. And uh, so, like I said, we are using Discord for those in-person things. And I hate that if somebody has to miss those because of that, uh, but I'm hoping that that's a short-term problem. Uh, and at least you'll have the videos in YouTube. So uh, let's see, so what other things? Um, maybe, uh, well, we talked about the stuff in 1410. Um, anybody that goes to the knowledge base right now will see that we have the 1410 release notes. We always post those ahead of the release getting published. Um, this was called out on Tony's slide back when my computer crashed, but this port, this 2124, definitely make sure that it's open. If you're hosted, you don't have to worry about that on our end. But if your firewall is a little restrictive, make sure you can get to your FileWave server on that TCP port because that's an additional notification port. Um, and we do already have articles about customizing the wallpaper on devices. So you can already see how that works. Um, the forcing a reboot. Uh, and again, it just has the screenshot from Central, but it's the exact same wording in anywhere. There was a question earlier from Sean about um, about booster configuration, just kind of some best practices and knowledge base articles. And then I, I just thought I'd mention that that one's been a really tough one for us because the answer is it depends. Uh, with booster configuration. It, it's largely dependent on the number of devices that you're managing. But the main thing that we want to do with boosters, it, it, if you're only managing iPads, for instance, and in and, and your MDM only, you're not managing Windows or Mac clients, boosters don't matter to you at all. But if you're managing a significant number of Mac or Windows clients, let's say anything over 500, you probably want to have at least one booster. Uh, the things that we find that are the most important is that your devices have a booster wherever they go. Um, and it kind of depends on your environment. So for instance, for a lot of K-12, an external booster isn't necessarily needed if the devices aren't leaving campus, right? So this is where all the it depends stuff comes up. Uh, but in other environments, like we worked with a university recently where a lot of their devices were actually off network during the production day. And what that did was because they did not have any DMZ or any DMZ based boosters, none of them are reachable for devices when they were remote. So all of those devices end up doing a home run to the server. And that's where we really find that, that the load on the server really impacts because trying to create and, and, and strip down those connections on the fly all the time uh, just hammers the server. So we really want to make sure that uh, booster routing is turned on uh, for devices. So they're routing messages through the boosters uh, that every device, as Josh mentioned, those booster uh, custom fields before, that every device has boosters uh, configured correctly. And I will say on that, yes, it's silly that you have to do that to configure it on a endpoint itself to know where to go. But until we have a smarter solution around that load balancing, that's the way it is today. That's not an optimal solution, but that's the way it is now. Uh, so you wanna make sure that they have a home that they can always reach, whether they're on the network or off the network, and that you have booster uh, uh, booster routing turned on. And if you have more than one booster that you have some kind of hierarchy of assignment of that with devices and, and hopefully load balanced in some way. So half of your devices are to booster one first and booster two second, and the other half are to booster two first and booster one second, those types of best practices. Uh, but in almost every environment, the answer differs. So it's been very hard for us to kind of build a wizard to you know answer a few questions and uh, and then give you a, a good answer. 
Yeah. And that's why that booster best practices in Discord, that, that's why I'm doing that to kind of try and talk through all the possible things that we can think of in that session and, and then try and make a general video that we can then have on YouTube. Uh, but like Jesse asked about if booster preference could be configured based on smart groups. Uh, so yeah, so I'll use an example of a, a customer that Tony and I were helping recently where they have a couple of smart groups that divide up their devices into basically four, four or so uh, different smart groups based on, I think the last character of the device name. Um, and then in each of those smart groups, they have a super pref set. And depending on which group you hit, you end up getting the right super pref that puts the boosters in a different order. Uh, in their case, they have four boosters that take all the connections. And so basically the four groups translate to getting one of the, one of the four boosters as their primary and the rest is as fallback. Um, and one of the things is if you have uh, CentOS or Linux based uh, boosters, by default, the number of maximum connections is set to, I believe 500 in the UI, but they can really take 2000 connections. Um, and there's another customer I've been working with lately where on Mac OS boosters, even though our UI prevents you from going over, I think 400 connections on a Mac OS booster, I'm running them at 2000 connections right now uh, to see, and I'm validating, I have to reach out to development to, to see where that lower number came from for Mac OS boosters, because obviously, if we could support more connections on Mac OS and Windows boosters, that would be great. Uh, but I don't want to introduce a setting that would break people. Um, so super prefs would be the way to assign by smart group. Um, and the uh, and Tony just answered in chat about IPs was another question, right? Um, so for computers, I've seen some people make custom fields that reveal the actual like. IP address that the device has, you know, because depending on where your server is, you might see like the firewalls IP, uh, but they'll make a custom field. When you think about IP, like Tony was mentioning for IPs, um, if your internal addresses are like 192.168.0.1, right? That IP address exists at Wendy's or McDonald's or, you know, Target. Uh, or some other place. Any network really could have internal addresses. So you want to think of if you were to ever use smart groups in relation to what network something's on, you have to think through seeing, you know, other things like can it can it look up a, an internal DNS name that wouldn't be look upable otherwise? But also you have to think about when those fields evaluate because they evaluate when inventory happens. So it gets a little bit tricky. Um, so that's why Tony mentioned about making a static group from it and then assigning it. Then it wouldn't be as smart, but it would not come with the same challenges that come with trying to figure out what network something's on. You're, you're better off trying to divide your things by like departments or names. If you can have a way that it kind of works out that it's a balanced number. Um, you know, and in boosters, you can set up a primary, a secondary, a tertiary. Um, so you can always set it up so that um, devices are hitting, you know, multiple boosters. So even if one is full, they'll fail to the next one. And we'll talk about that in that booster thing, the booster session on Discord, and it'll be in that video. So I think that'll be really helpful for folks. These KB articles in the knowledge base are good to look through if you've never looked through them before. Gosh, I'm not sure that happened, but I just wanted to check. Did you just use the word unlookable? Tertiary. No, yeah, like and tertiary. Unlookable was the word that you used there. And I, I know what tertiary <laughs> means, but unlookable, I, I've not heard that one before. <laughs> Can I interject here on, on the on the? Yeah, yeah. Thing? Is that okay? Because um, there's a fundamental flaw with the, the whole process of using a super pref, because you've got to wait for the device to check in before you can get that super breath. And if it's all you've got a booster configured for a different location, you've got to wait for that to fail before it will then get the super breath, right? And so this is where this, this kind of whole, whole idea of trying to manage it in this way kind of falls down. I've posted a link to a KB, which is an idea of how to try and automate your booster configuration so that it is configured based on something 
that is unique to your environment. We can't come up with an example that's going to cover everybody's environment. It's just not possible because we have no idea of knowing how you set your networks up. And as Josh said, if you try and do it based on IP, you could be in a cafe that's got the same thing as if you're at home or, or whatever, right? Um, can you do it based on domain, for example? Which And so there's examples in that KB of kind of how to look at that. But what you're doing is you're having to really put a process that's local on the device so the device can establish where it is and then pre-configure the boosters based on that. And then it will check in to Farwave, right? But if you try and do it with SuperPress, it doesn't matter if it's static group, smart group, whatever, it's got to have that failure first if it's got an incorrect booster configured for where it happens to be now at that point in time when it tries to check in. Yeah. Yeah, and this article's here in the booster section, so that's a good, a good thing to talk about. And I was thinking, I had shown this for a second. I wanted to mention someone had a good idea because we had so many additions and subtractions from the uh, from the TCP article. Whoops, I didn't mean to select that. But I made some color changes here uh, so that you can tell what is leaving versus or has left versus what's getting added because it was getting a little a little crazy. And ultimately, the things that are marked as removed will ultimately get removed from this list. But we keep them here for a little bit so that people realize that they're leaving. So, you know, you should be able to at least tell you know what's going away versus what's new. And if it says localhost, that means on the server itself, it goes to that port, but remotely, you don't have to worry about it going to that port. So here's that new one, 2124, that is an incoming port. So I just wanted to mention that. Because it was getting a little, a little out of hand with changes to ports, but that's because we're you know, trying to update everything and the whole switch from zero MQ to NATs. Okay, uh, let's see. So I think I, I, I didn't spend as much time on the Alliance forums. They really are a regular you know, forum that if you check it out, it works like any other. It's running on Envision Board, which is a standard popular uh, forum software. And so check it out. And if you have any trouble, actually, I should say this about both. So this Alliance support, this is where you could ask a question about these forums. Like it'll open up a ticket with like me and Jonathan Kane so that we could help you. You know, if you're like, how I, I can't figure out how to do this particular thing, we'll help you out. And in Discord, you will see that there is a tickets and you can pick to open a ticket, which will go to me and Jonathan Kane uh, at the moment and we'll help you out um, with whatever's confusing or not working. So, but they're not file wave product tickets. They're about these platforms because we figure within the platform, there's probably some need for support related to that because our regular support like Derek's team wouldn't necessarily support this because uh, professional services and customer experience really take care of uh, the forums and the uh, discord. Okay. Any other questions we missed? Oh, there was a question about how did we determine that server performance was impacted, right? Um, I would say that it was a bit of a discovery process through seeing problems crop up. We, we have a group of customers that we work with and with FileWave Assist that's actually growing. So we get some intelligence from the folks that we work the most with and we started seeing things like, you know, that notifications weren't happening, even though the ports are open for notifications. And uh, so when the server was super busy, we were realizing that there was a problem, but we didn't know what. And we, we did some investigation like, um, I have a script that I made that I can run on a FileWave server that tells me how many connections are on each network port. Uh, so we were noticing things like, there were 2000 devices that were actively connected to a FileWave server where there were boosters in place and it didn't really make sense. And so we started to just have conversations to pick apart what we were seeing. Um, but it, it was most obvious if you use Netstat and you 
look at the, the number of connections per port and you see things like there's a lot of these connections on this port and also the CPU of the server is now at 90% to 100% all the time. For hosted servers, we can see the server performance really easily because it's all in AWS and Oracle. So um, it, it, was, it was mostly a discovery process, uh, seeing things like high CPU, seeing ports that were in use that were not expected. Um, and actually there was some behavior that is by design, like here's um, something that is just a fact of how it was. It was with zero MQ and it's this way with NATS. If you go to a booster, you will connect to that booster with zero MQ or with NATS. The, the booster goes away because it fails or it gets full and your client will fail to the FileWave server, assuming that there's no other booster. Um, it will connect to the FileWave server for zero MQ or NATS. Um, and actually, if you had a second booster, it will still fail to the server for NATS rather than going to a booster two. And zero MQ actually two. For both cases, it'll fail to the server for zero MQ or NATS, even if there's another booster. Um, and we looked and, and NATS in particular uses very little CPU. It's not so much a problem. I just looked at it in this problem and said, hey, you know, there's 2000 connections to NATS on this particular server. Like it feels like we should probably be handling that, you know, sending the connection to another booster, right? Keeping it, leveraging the boosters because otherwise why would you have boosters? So like we've been looking at, you know, making that change, but it was that way under zero MQ2. So, you know, that's not, that's not the reason for the busyness. Um, so it's some of that. And there was some work done in the past to put more telemetry in FileWave servers. That's not active really uh, on servers right now, but we have a lot of the work to gather more intelligence about how the servers are doing. And we have some work internally to look at those hosted servers and the Oracle Cloud ones um, to watch how they're doing. Because if we can see how they're doing, then we can proactively um, you know, know that there's a problem before someone even sees it. Hope that explained it. <laughs> and, oh, and the renaming issues. So uh, what Jerry wrote about the renaming issues, that, that is true. So like when we would see this performance thing, at first it was very difficult because different things would, you would see different things. You'd see notifications wouldn't happen. So like you create a smart group in your admin and you don't see it actually appear. You assign something and you don't see the association appear, but if you quit your admin and restart it, it does. Even though NATS was reachable and functioning, the server was so busy that those notifications weren't happening. Or when you go to rename a device, it's supposed to then queue up like a, if it's let's say an ipad it's supposed to queue up a push notification to do that and we were just seeing things like that and through this work we've actually been trying to actively find other problems that may just not have been seen before um, we have a thing called the scheduler that handles a lot of tasks and you know through looking at some of these things we've discovered other things that can be improved in future versions so there's been a lot of work to improve performance and look at what could be improved in the next versions. So I, unless there's other things, well, if there were no other things, and if we missed anything, uh, then, you know, you can always, uh, for instance, you can actually send me messages both on the forums and on Discord, whichever one you're on, or you can email professional.services at filewave.com. Um, you know, if it's about PS stuff or really any of the, you know, the forum things that we have here, let me share this so that you have these barcodes if anyone needs them. Uh, but you can reach out to me or customer experience is customer.experience at filewave.com. Um, if it's about like licenses or 
contacts, updating contacts, you know, customer experience. Between customer experience and professional services, we should be able to help you with most things that are not like you're having a, an issue and it's broken uh, and you need support. And then, you know, it's help.filewave.com or you can email help at filewave.com. So we try to make it pretty easy and it's basically sort of three paths that you'd want to go. Um, but if you don't remember who to go to, go to any of us and we'll put you in the right place. Okay. So then, I don't know, Tobias, did you want to say anything? No, I, I think um, I just want to thank everyone for being here. I actually, you know, looked through the registrations and we have over 20 countries represented, which again, I think is a, is a very nice compliment to the very global, you know, small but global community that we're building here. Um, I really encourage you to, to get in touch with us, you know, through the different channels that we, we presented you again today. Um, yeah, and, and looking forward to have you again latest in three months from now. Is there any, anything else to, to add from, from Tony? I just thank you very much, everybody, for joining. As always, we really enjoyed doing these, and we look forward to doing the next one, too. Thanks so much. Thank you all.